Welcome to a very spooky episode of the FeeCast, your weekly dose of economic thinking from your friends at the Foundation for Economic Education. I am Richard Lawrence, here today with our expanded panel of Anna Jane Peril, Dan Sanchez, Marianne March, and our special guest, T.K. Coleman. Welcome, T.K. Always happy to have it's you here. It's good to be back. And we are here... Uh, The weekend is upon us. Halloween is going to be celebrated this weekend. How are you guys looking at your plans? I have a killer costume idea. I'm going to be a cave woman. I'm going to tease my hair up really big and draw on a unibrow, (laughs) and I'm going to grunt at everybody all day. It's going to be awesome. (laughs) Will we have the pleasure of that in the office as well? (laughs) Yes. Excellent. Yes, because Halloween falls on a Wednesday this year. It it, it does, and and that does end up making some difficulty for, for planning, but... We get two weekends now that we can celebrate it, right? We, That's we true. get the pre-Halloween and the post. Yeah, yes. you have to have at least like three costumes the way that it falls this year. It's very <laughs> stressful. I have a five-year-old, so she'll be able to trick-or-treat without the judgment that college kids <laughs> get when, when they trick-or-treat. Uh, there's actually a law that was recently passed against like people above a certain age trick-or-treating. So? Wait, yeah. where was in, that? In, in a local community. What, yeah, what a, lot of, a lot of places in Virginia, I read about this, that in Newport News there were... Um, Fines and things for people over the age of 12 years old. and 12 the cutoff. Yeah. And after a certain time of night, no trick-or-treaters at all. And they're suggesting that they're maybe not going to have this really be enforced by police, that police are just going to really be looking out for safety. But it's like, why would you even create a law that you have no intention of really But also, how is that a safety issue? You're basically saying, I, I mean, like, how is, a, how is somebody who's over the age of 12 asking for candy at someone's door not safe? I mean, I guess when you say, I don't know, I just, it doesn't make I sense I feel like the whole situation becomes much more unsafe when you have cops out there actually patrolling for ages. Mm-hmm. What are they going to do, arrest the 13-year-olds? Yeah. Well, probably not. I mean, we would hope not, I guess. But they, if, you know, it's at the discretion of the police at this point, because it is a law in the books, it's just astonishing that at the age of 13 years old, essentially, where we want to start making people criminals. Childhood is over with. No more trick or treating. <laughs> yeah. You have to buy your own candy at the drugstore. <laughs> so, so, so devil's advocate, because I totally disagree with this law, but devil's yeah. advocate. I'm, I'm assuming that it's not for the 13 year olds. I'm assuming that this is for the 18, mm-hmm. 19, 20 year olds or the 30 year olds who are knocking on people's doors <laughs> hey, what's ever so that? creepily on Halloween night. So yeah. what's your response to that? Like, let's let's treat the argument fairly. Well, like, I mean, so if you're, if, if somebody comes to my door who's 20 and that offends me as a person, why don't I... Or frightens you. Oh, so you're saying that you think it's actually people do get scared by, uh, like, adults coming coming to ask for candy? Yeah, like, like, <laughs> like, you know, some creepy person can be like, well, this is the night, right? Where people <laughs> yeah. are knocking on strangers' doors and so forth. Right, well... Yeah, and you've got older people... Masked there. adults. Yeah. Like, you know, yeah. Ma- it turns into like a home invader or something. Yeah. Right. And, and when you're dressed in a costume, there's no difference between being 25 and being yeah. 55. I mean... Very true. That's true. Yeah. I guess I would just say to the people who are giving out candy, you don't have to open your door. That's right, It's right. nice if you want to give out candy to trick-or-treaters, but if you feel that there's somebody on the other side of your door who's scary, keep I it I suppose locked. if it was, yeah, if it was a really big concern of mine, which is other than the concern being it's just it, it makes me angry that a 19-year-old is trying to get free candy from me, which I would be <laughs> like, really no, I'm not is. giving you candy. That's what I would do. Great but costume, if was, bye. If I was truly concerned about perhaps the fright factor, maybe like make a cute little sign that says we inv- we'd love to have our young you know community members <laughs> well, take it, candy. But it seems like, like a, a lot of these like, like nanny state laws, it's it's all about avoiding difficult conversations. Yes. Mm-hmm. It's like I don't even want to have that conversation mm-hmm. of, of like telling someone like I'm, I'm not going to give you candy because you're, you're too old. I think so I want the law to do this. For right. Me. I think that's the main point. Right. Yeah. To what degree do we need mm-hmm. to legislate this sort of stuff? Right. Yeah. And mm-hmm. have cops out there ready to enforce it versus just being able to say no. It just seems weird to say it's a misdemeanor for somebody to ask for candy. Dan, if I asked you for a Starburst or something, are you going to, like, you then would have, in these communities, you would be able to call the cops on me. That just seems silly. Yeah. Well, this weekend, my husband Colin and I are not going trick-or-treating. We are going to have a party on our block with our neighbors, and we're going to have candy out. Um, But we are still trying to figure out what we are going to dress as. And in an effort to try to figure this out, you know, do you go funny? Do you go scary? You know, we were watching a bunch of YouTube videos, and we ran across one that had a bunch of old Halloween commercials from, like, the 80s. Mm. And I'm watching this thing, and, you know, they're talking about at, you know, Lionel Toy Store or whatever other outmoded place that were selling costumes. They've got all these awful costumes. Like, I remember seeing one 
of Yoda. It was a blue Yoda mask, right? So it was not even the right color. And a plastic smock that on the front of it said Star Wars. It was like, you know, in, in one, theaters. In theaters, yeah, this, this uh, Halloween or whatever it was. But it wasn't even trying, really, aside from the face shape, mm-hmm. right, to be anything resembling the character. And it just struck me, and I have an article out uh, this past Wednesday, actually, on this, why Halloween costumes used to suck. I think we say why they're terrible. Um, but the whole point of the article was it just it just dawned on me the reason we actually have true to screen costumes today off the shelf is because we are so much wealthier and we have the ability to command mm. all sorts of other uh, people overseas for example to make these things for us and to make them in a way that we actually appreciate we actually think is screen accurate and so the result of globalization of being able to you know sort of outsource all the different things that we can't do for ourselves one of the outputs of that is that we have good Halloween costumes now, and mm-hmm. it's a sign how much wealthier we are now yeah, because of true. global and trade. Those people aren't just supplying the demand. People across the world now, because of globalization, are constituting the demand because especially the, a lot of these characters, they're, they're famous and beloved in, in China and in India. Totally. And, and, so, so, and when there's a bigger market for... Mm-hmm. Uh, a, a good, then you can afford to put more labor into it and more spe- specialization and better quality. That's the point, is the larger the market, the greater the degree of the division of labor and specialization that we can have, and the cheaper everything is, and the wealthier we all are And the higher of it. quality. The higher quality. And to me, also, like, the more specific the good can be to the interest of the person, the consumer that it speaks to, right? I think that it also makes it, I guess, items can be very, very... Um, tailored to your interest. I think that that's one of the benefits that you see too, is that you can get a very specific, I can get Yoda that looks like this, right? right? I can mm-hmm. get this kind of Yoda costume. That's not only true to this, but you know, specifically in this film or something like that. I think that it is, that's another thing that you, you can see even is. get a Yoda costume for your dog. I've seen yeah. so yeah. many pet costumes this year. <laughs> Some good ones too, little sharks and Wonder Woman costumes. And think about that before. None of that was off the shelf, right? You yeah. could always make a costume, right. right? You could always kind of cobble together maybe something that mm-hmm. resembled Mr. Incredible. But mm-hmm. now you can actually have well, the Mr. Incredible costume for 20 bucks from Target and you buy one, you get one 50% off. Yeah. Well, I think what we're seeing is kind of the demand. So yeah, Halloween happened, you know, in the 80s or the 70s, for example, and, and it was more likely that you would make your costume from scratch. Um, and there's a lot of like labor and resources that mm-hmm. go into that experience. And it was necessary because you want your kids to trick or treat. Um, but now think about you have that choice. You can say, I'm just going to buy a costume. Right. Or if you truly get joy from that experience of making a costume, that is still a possibility. Right. And so you preserve not only do the people who enjoy making costumes and truly believe in like the creative experience and kind of all of those benefits that's preserved but then you also get people increase their utility of costume costumes in general mm-hmm. because they can outsource it, it if they want it all comes down to choice yeah and and at that time things like star wars um disney princesses have hadn't even come out there, there wasn't as much of an advance in just these iconic characters that mm-hmm. kids want to be and want to look exactly like and, um, you know, because the Char- Charlie Brown Halloween special, it was just like a sheet right. with, with a bunch <laughs> of holes all over. Um, and um, so it was just like simple, scary ideas. And, and there weren't, um, again, it's like the advance of the market because we, we've in some ways had a, a much better movies and, and stories, Harry Potter yeah, we were so costume poor back then. In mm-hmm. fact, the article that I wrote has a bunch of these examples of like you know Luke Skywalker with a smock that says Star Wars on it, or Alf. If you guys remember Alf, it's got like a little word bubble on the smock that says Trick or Treat. It's like you know where is this coming from? And and the image at the very top of the article actually is a, is a person in a in a ghost costume, right? And it says on it. I am a ghost. <laughs> and so, you know, I feel like if you need to explain in words or use words uh, written on something to explain what you are, that's probably a design fail. Um, so it's obviously a very, uh, you know, festive time for us. Is anyone else going to dress up? I, I plan to avoid it. <laughs> I'm thinking that I wasn't going to dress up, but now I'm thinking of trying to get a costume 
that says, I am the criminal that was arrested for trick-or-treating at age 30. <laughs> yes. I think that'd be like, ooh, that's a scary yeah. guy. You know, of <laughs> all places, I think you'd be able to find it at one of those pop-up Halloween stores that, you know, emerge sometime in late September, early yeah. October. And that's a new thing, too, right? I love those, yeah. Oh, there's nothing scarier than a useless law, though, <laughs> for your costume. Ooh, to be to be like a scroll of a law and it says useless next to it? That'd yep. be pretty spooky. Yep. Libertarian horror movies. <laughs> but Richard, you just brought something up, which I think is an interesting topic, which is Halloween pop-up stores. Yeah. And we've been seeing these for a lot of years now in empty, empty storefronts. Right. And doing a little reading before this podcast, I found out that those stores really became prominent after the 2008 recession because really yeah because commercial real estate landlords were so desperate because ah. they're at malls anchor stores were seeing sales plummeting and strip malls were seeing a lot of stores closing down hmm. and so it became an opportunity for the landlords to have a little short-term rental where they can rent the space out and make some money I think that's so often missed well, when we talk about the boom bust cycle yeah. that that really is the fault of the government, but just the fact that the bust is actually the healing process. Like the mm -hmm. bust is what's actually fixing the malinvestments of the boom. Right. So in this case, you know, a Halloween business actually made more sense given people's preferences than mm -hmm. these long-term big mm -hmm. housing pr projects. And um, and so you know, the, this this capital that that um, then has to be liquidated in in the bus liquidation doesn't mean it just disappears that all this wealth just disappears right it means that it's repurposed to things that make more sense like halloween stores which is an example of creative destruction right mm -hmm. taking resources that are underused or not used and putting them in a productive purpose which in some cases mm -hmm. we might you know question whether <laughs> halloween costumes are the best way to do that but that's what the customer wants right yeah. i mean for last minute purposes yeah. for just being able to browse through the store mm -hmm. it's obviously valuable to people in that area to be able to have such a place mm -hmm. yeah and even places like party city which have brick and mortar stores will open up pop-up locations and they start hunting for these things as early as january I mean, it would be nice if we had lived in a world where the savings rate was high, so high that people really were saving enough to finance a house in the long term sure. and weren't blowing it on things, on short-term pur purchases like Halloween um, uh, costumes. But that wasn't the reality. That wasn't the reality mm -hmm. of consumer preferences. And government ma manipulation was making it seem like it was, that people were saving more than they actually were. And so this shift was actually m reflecting people's actual preferences better. You know, looking at you, Dan, reminds me that we missed last week Beard Watch 2018, <laughs> which, by the way, people who are watching are able to see. Uh, however, it is important for me to note as well that our podcast is available in audio form on Spotify, iTunes, mm -hmm. and Google Play. And so in case you are driving and you can't watch the progress that we are monitoring here at Be Beard Watch 2018, <laughs> you can find our podcast on those various other platforms. I yeah. do have a beard milestone to report that Ooh. when I was zipping this up, it actually caught. Oh, my, Dan, my I'm beard. so excited for you. <laughs> so, yeah. That's phenomenal. Well, and so, you know, going back to the notion of, of Halloween costumes, right? So we live in a culture today that is becoming more and more sensitive mm -hmm. to what we are dressing as. And some costumes, it turns out, are becoming off limits. And we haven't had sort of the onslaught of that yet because we're celebrating Halloween this coming weekend. But I think we can begin to think that this it's coming, right? It's uh, 2018, so we're constantly talking about whether something is cultural appropriation or maybe something a bit more benign, which is just people dressing up as costumes, in costumes. And so the question I have to you is, uh, we've talked a lot this year on this very podcast about uh, the Marvel movies, and particularly Black Panther, and it's a big, big thing this year. What do you guys think is going to happen if you end up having a bunch of Black Panther costumes out there, are we going to have a uh, rejection of maybe little white kid out there wearing a Black Panther costume? What's the you know degree to which this is going to be another fight that we have in society? Hmm. As, as a predictive answer, yeah. what do I think is going to happen, independently of my thoughts about what I think should happen, which I definitely want to get And we'll into. get there in a minute. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. As a predictive answer, I think it's all about how it's going to be done. 
because there are, there are different kinds of costumes. There are different ways you can try to look like someone else. So for instance, um, with Spider-Man, if I wanted to look like Spider-Man, I can paint myself red. That'd be one approach, right? Um, or I can put on a costume that covers up my whole body and now I look like Spider-Man. I think if people wear Black Panther mask they, or, or like outfits or costumes uh, and they do it in a way it's like, hey, I'm me, but I'm wearing this outfit. Just like people do for Star Wars. Like most people, well, I actually don't know what most people would, would do, but if I were to go as like Luke Skywalker or something, I can put on the outfit and people kind of mm -hmm. know. Sure. Um, I, I would predict no one's going to have a problem with that. On the other hand, if someone, said, if someone puts on blackface and says, hey, I'm one of the characters in Black Panther, I am 100% certain that there's going to be a whole lot of conversation about how that's insensitive, how that's offensive, mm -hmm. and that person's probably going to have some difficulties to deal with if they do that. That's my predictive answer. It's mm -hmm. all about how it's mm -hmm. going to be done. What, one of the controversies last year was the Mo Moana costume oh, yeah. of the character Maui because uh, Maui like it doesn't wear a shirt and so much of the costume is like a body costume mm -hmm. um, and of all the tattoos and yeah. on darker skin right exactly mm -hmm. I actually ended up seeing that on a list aimed toward parents for this Halloween on costumes to avoid mm. right I mean mm -hmm. so there are mm -hmm. lists now and they can be very helpful especially if this is something that matters to you yeah yeah it's, it's a tricky subject because, I, well, I definitely agree that uh, if I were to see somebody in blackface, that would be even offensive to me as a white person because there's a history sure. of, of um, white actors putting on black paint to resemble to resemble African Americans so instead of just hire African Americans, right? Instead of just hiring somebody who looks that way already, but then, but the, but I know that culturally there's a really fine line. Even just today, I'm hearing about. Kendall Jenner, who got in trouble mm. for having really curly and teased hair in a photo shoot for Vogue, and people are accusing her of cultural appropriation and saying that she was wearing an afro. And Vogue denies that it was supposed to be an afro. They say it was supposed to be a nod to the early 20th century, 20th century. But it's just, even if I've got curls in my hair today, for, for our viewers who were just listening, and if they were teased up really big, would I be accused of mm. cultural appropriation? I'm not sure. It's, it's sticky. TK, you, you had a prescriptive as well as a descriptive? Yeah. Um, I, I, have, I have so much I could say on this topic. I, I don't even know where to begin. You know, I've never been interested at all in the slightest in discussions on who should and should not be offended by X. Mm -hmm. Because I accept it as a fundamental fact of life that different people are going to be offended by different things. Sure. Mm -hmm. And a part of what makes human communication complex is that we have to navigate a world where I'm going to be bothered by things that don't bother you. You're going to be bothered by things that don't bother mm -hmm. me. How do we sort that out? That's something that we're never going to get rid of. There's no law we can pass. There's no philosophical technique we can mm -hmm. apply. apply. There's no strategy we can employ that's going to eliminate that fundamental problem across the lines, whether it has anything to do with race or not. Mm -hmm. So for me, this is really a, a question of cost-benefit analysis. Um, what do you choose to care about and what cost are you willing to pay for the things that you say you care about? So let's use an example like being married. There are things that I can do that annoy my wife. OK, um, and I can talk all day about, oh, well, she shouldn't be bothered by that. Well, she is. Yeah. OK, she is. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to change that. So the first question is, do I care? You know, is being at peace with this person a priority to me or am I in a state where I feel like ah, I don't care about being at odds with her about that sort of thing? If being at peace is a priority to me, then I will modify my behavior without a sense of being a victim, without a sense of self-compromise. And I'll be honest that the only reason I'm modifying my behavior is because I care about this person, mm -hmm. this bothers them, and I'm not going to do a thing that bothers me because I prioritize being at peace with them. Right. Mm -hmm. That's life, right? Um, on the other hand, there are moments where I can say, here's a form of behavior that bothers someone over there. I don't care about my relationship with that person or I don't care about how it affects me that this person or these group of people don't like me. That's fine. This happens to be true politically, right? I may come down on political positions and there are people that may say, well, I think anyone who believes that is cruel. Well, I'm, I'm okay with that, right? That's the cost of having a position on something mm -hmm. and I don't modify my behavior in accordance with their preferences. But one thing that I give up the moment I choose to take that stance 
is the right to treat myself like a victim. I'm not a victim, right? Um, I'm not a victim if I do things that people don't like and I say I choose not to care about the fact that you don't like them. Right. So when it comes to the whole thing about wearing costumes that offend certain cultures and so mm -hmm. forth, I don't think you're going to win a debate about who people, I mean, what people should be offended by. I don't think you're going to speak to a demographic and say, you should grow up and stop being offended by X because even if you're right, you're just not going to be successful, right? Mm -hmm. Show me evidence to the contrary. I'm willing to change my mind, <laughs> all right? So if I know that putting on a costume is going to offend someone, then I got to ask myself, do I care? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is it a priority to me? And, and if mm -hmm. it is, then I modify my behavior. And if I say, well, I don't care because this is my position and they shouldn't be offended, well, that's fine, but don't cry about it when those same people get angry at you and they misunderstand you in very predictable ways, right? right? right. Yeah. Regardless of how much we may try, we can't legislate feelings. And yeah. even mm -hmm. without bringing government into the matter, we can't command people to have the feelings that we wish that they would have. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. what you're saying, TK, is what your uh, position is that it's all come down, it all comes down to personal choice, right? You can choose to modify your behavior if it's worth it, or you can choose not to and, and face the consequences. And that's what we do by yeah. living in a society. We have a lot of people who may have different opinions. And it's up to you whether you see yourself as a victim or whether you just say, this isn't worth me worrying about. Well, I want to resound yeah. that story. Yeah. I think I saw this in practice uh, recently. Um, <clears throat> Uh, one of my favorite podcasts, other than the FeeCast, uh, my favorite murder. Uh, it's two comedians who just talk about, they pick out murders and they talk about them. It's, it's very dark. But um, basically, they they did a t-shirt line that was summer camp themed because mm. it was a summer t-shirt uh, series for their you know merchandise and their whatever, their podcast. And uh, the summer camp themed t-shirt had a teepee on it representing kind of when people would sleep in teepees at summer camp. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and it became, as I was listening to each episode as it came out, they were commenting on their fan base being really offended by that. Um, and they really... I would say, I would call it overcorrection, but that implies that I think that it was the wrong choice. I'm just saying that it was very, they responded immensely to their fan base freaking out. And they said they took down the designs and they apologized profusely on, on their uh, episodes and they donated $10,000 to Native American initiatives. And it was just this thing where I think you, it points out, do I care? Do I care about the relationship I have with my fan base or with, mm -hmm. you know, that even, even a specific component of my fan base that cares about appropriation. Yeah. Uh, and I think that that was, it, 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 it's a very, very, very interesting observation that do I care about my relationship with these people and do I want to offend them? And they ended up releasing a new design. Yeah, with just the teeth, with regular, with a regular tent. It was, it was really interesting to see real time how I was like, oh, cute t-shirt. Oh my gosh, people are commenting yeah. on this. And then immediately, you know, I mean, people that I love. But I isn't love that a sign her. of the immediacy of the response in commercial society, mm -hmm, right? You mm -hmm. think about how rapidly they were able to address the concerns of their market mm -hmm. and how quickly they had something else out that, you know, okay, so maybe it wasn't perfect, but it actually was something that people in their audience would actually prefer to buy. That's a really good point. I didn't even think about it like that. But yeah, how the, mar I mean, it's a, it is a great example of how the market responds quicker than perhaps another, you know, an institution that is not beholden to its its profit, with shareholders, to sure. its customers. Um if you are not beholden to your customer, you are less likely to affect change and perhaps change that matters. I think it's really powerful to uh, realize that you ultimately have no control over whether someone else is going to be offended. Sure. At the same time, you have complete control over whether you yourself are going to be offended. And, and I think that that's where sort of it's, it's not so useful to try to question the motives of other people. Um, because they have their motives and they're going to do what they're going to do. But questioning motives within yourself, I think, is really powerful because I do think that a lot of this um, th this offense that's taken over Halloween costumes, that is, that is basically identity politics, and it, which is a form of power politics. And, and I, I think of, like, what my choice is to, to whether to be offended. So, so I'm of Mexican descent. And so I, I can choose to be offended by someone, you know, wearing a Mexican costume. A sombrero or something mm -hmm. like that. Right, right. Mm -hmm. um, and if, if I was really caught up in identity politics and I, I wanted to 
em empower myself politically at the expense of another group and to, to get certain kinds of advantages and or to be a victim or pity points exactly then, then I could do that but really I think that's like disempowering for, for myself so, so I choose not to do it because, and, and that's where I think analyzing the motives can really help so let me let me let me piggyback off that and push back a little bit mm -hmm. so I, I agree with you on that that self empowerment message. I, I made up my mind a long time ago that I would never allow the quality of my day to be dictated by what someone chooses to do with a Halloween costume. Mm. Um, even if I can understand other people's inability to do that with great sympathy, um, I recognize where I have choice. And this this is not the thing that's going to bring down T.K. Coleman. Mm. There's nobody <laughs> on this planet that's going to wear blackface. And then that's going to be the answer to why I didn't become all that I could be. No mm. way am I going out like that. Um, <laughs> however, um, I, I think the, the understanding the motives things thing, I think it works both ways too. I think there are some people who get offended or who get their feelings hurt or who get upset or who feel threatened yep. for reasons that have nothing to do with a, a consciously made choice to be offended or to uh, assert power over someone else. Um, I think most forms of offense happen to be um, you know, instinctive responses to various forms of conditioning we had, we've had. So you see someone white and blackface, for instance, that can be for some people just like hearing the N word it, yes. and, and, and like mm -hmm. it, it, it hurts and it takes you back, not because you're trying to let it control you, but, but for you, it means something specific. And, 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 and it's sort of like, what are you doing? Like, what are you trying to say to me? And for some people, it makes them feel safe. It makes them feel threatened. And I know it's fashionable to make fun of people who feel unsafe. Uh, <laughs> but if you want to understand who you're dealing with and figure out the best way to resolve conflict, I think it's useful to, to acknowledge that that sort of thing is at play, too. There are definitely people who, you, who try to play power games and use that kind of stuff to make you squirm. Yes. But there are many people out there who just genuinely feel hurt by it. And there yeah. are a lot of opportunities when we're dressing up as other people to actually, in many cases, maybe definitely not blackface, but like to actually emulate people who are of a different culture than we are. Mm -hmm. And that's a bit of hero worship, right? And so you have the mm -hmm. opportunity at Halloween perhaps to, you know, dress up in a non-offensive uh, way uh, as someone who might not be of your same culture. And, and that's... In many ways, I, I think it's interesting to distinguish between appropriation, which has got a negative connotation. It's stealing something from someone, taking their identity away from them and, and you know, assuming it, right, versus just sort of culture, which is the exchange of ideas and customs and styles through communication, firstly, but also through commerce. We have so many examples of, you know, things that we have in our American culture that we wouldn't have had without trading with China or without trading with uh, Madagascar or who, wherever else that we're finding mm -hmm. things that are our value. We don't have to make those things ourselves, but we're enriched by them. And so I think there's a distinction to be made between sort of the mean-spirited type mm -hmm. of appropriation, right, and the more general way in which culture grows through exchange. Yeah, yeah. Um, I recently watched the the toys that made us. Uh, it's a documentary. Oh yeah, it's an awesome show. Mm -hmm. And they had one episode about Transformers, and Transformers is one of the uh, really popular costumes these days. Um, but it originally came out in the, in the eighties, and and it was interesting to see like how how it evolved. That it started when um, GI Joe, like the original GI Joe figures, were adopted in Japan, uh, were borrowed from America in, into Japan, mm. and but then in order to market to to Japanese children, they made it like a cyborg, uh, part robot uh, hero, sort of like a Power Rangers sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, and then um, and then they they made that into like a transforming type hero, and then and it eventually evolved into what basically were the Transformers, and then Amer the American com toy company uh, borrowed that back and, and marketed it to American children. So, so yeah, so this, this cro it, with commerce, this, this cross-culture, cross-pollination, uh, it, it can, can be a really good thing. And it's peaceful, too, and it mm -hmm. makes us less alien to each other. Yeah. And I think there's a difference between imitation and mockery. Yes. Imitation yes. is the sincerest form of flattery, and mockery is just mean sometimes, mm -hmm. unless it's for purposes of comedy. But yes, yeah. even then, these days, yeah. So, so I, I think there's a useful distinction that that mm -hmm. relates very well to the one Richard just made, which is a distinction between um, a person trying to be offensive versus 
a person doing something that happens to be offensive. Mm. And sometimes these two things get conflated. So uh, Megyn Kelly recently told the story of someone who wore, someone who was white who wore, uh, dressed up as Diana Ross for mm. Halloween. Mm-hmm. Um, and Megyn Kelly's taking a lot of flack right now because she basically said, isn't that flattering? Everybody wants to be like mm. Diana Ross. Like, why would that be a problem? Um, and, and so I think this distinction for moments like that could be very useful. So one, is this person who dressed up like Diana Ross racist? Did they wake up that morning and say, I know that if I do this, people are going to be hurt, but I don't care. <laughs> sure. Maybe maybe that didn't happen. Yeah. Right. Maybe there was no thought of that at all. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, a, a lot of a lot of our um, maturity as human beings comes from thinking that things are OK or harmless or there's not going to be a reaction. We speak a certain way and people give us feedback in the form of disapproval. And then we step back and we say, ah, hmm, what do I want to do about that? Do I agree? Do I disagree? Do I want to change? Do I want to compromise? And so forth. So we all have personal experience with thinking that it's okay to joke a certain way or say a certain thing. And then someone says, hey, I don't like that. I don't appreciate that. And then we go, oh, I didn't know. Sure. It's just that, thankfully, most of us haven't been caught on camera doing it, so we still get to, you know, fly under the radar. Um, but in, in this case, that very well could have happened, and that may have happened in many instances where people do things that offend us regardless of what the offense is. Um, but that's different from saying, I know there's going to be a predictable response right. to what I do. Being intentionally um, provocative in a very mean-spirited sort of way. Yeah. And, and, and I and I believe you have people in both category. I believe you have people that do things like this and they hurt people's feelings and they're completely shocked and they're like, no, like mm-hmm. I'm not racist. I'm not sexist. I didn't know. And, 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 and it stinks for them because now they've got to be stigmatized and lumped into this evil category and they don't get a second chance because their their moment of failure happened on the big screen. Uh, but then there are there are also people who say, you know, um, I know this is going to ruffle some feathers, and that's what I want sure, to do. Sure, and, yeah. and you have the freedom to do that. It's just that you don't get to be a victim when you get the predictable response yeah, you the were aiming for. Well, yeah. the the, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, I, I feel like, but I feel like this that conversation kind of leads to, well, now we're judging people based on intention, and like I, that's a hard thing to do, mm. right? I mean, we can't. That's I, I don't. I don't know. It, it's hard. It's hard to identify intention, right? You should only judge. In theory, you should only judge people based on the action, right? And then the consequence of that action. Mm-hmm. So it, I just don't. I don't know. I, it's it's hard. I guess we project a lot of intention on things that may sure. or may not be intentionally hurtful. Um, and so I think that I guess I don't know. In this situation, if we're talking about appropriation, if you do something that's you absolutely did not intend to undermine someone's culture or to hurt someone, what do you do in the sense that you've you've done this thing? You've appropriated something that hurts someone that is invested in that culture. Yeah, I think one I of the, mean, I think one of the main problems we have based on both of your comments is that we've sort of thrown empathy out the window, mm-hmm, right? And yeah. and I think one of the other things that may uh, be a benefit of of commerce is that we again are less alien to each other, we're more empathetic with each other, we can understand each other better. It all comes down to communication. And unfortunately, we're finished uh, with our time today, so we're going to have to mm. cut it off here. Our intention of course is to be provocative and have a great discussion. We <laughs> will uh, definitely do that in, in future episodes and on this topic Dan's as beard. well. Yes, Beard Watch 2018. <laughs> but for now, we hope that everyone has a very happy Halloween and we'll see you next week on the Feecast. 